All right, folks, then we are uh, we are live here, and I want to welcome everybody to the State of the Markets, which, we again, we should have done at the end of January. But the, the time lapse, no change, and everything is kind of about the same way it was. So I want to take some time here and read these disclaimers and disclosures. Basically, anything I say is could be, maybe true, maybe not true. Uh, don't know. Uh, we, we think it's true, but it could change at any time. Uh, and I wanted to thank our sponsors. Um, our sponsor actually here is our uh, our uh, mid our mid uh, mid cap fund principal. So I want to thank them uh, for buying our lunch. And just some housekeeping there. If you have a cell phone um, or maybe a hearing aid, you might uh, you might want to turn that down. I don't know how the hearing aid works, but uh, Jeff, you've got one. And huh? Yeah, put it in restaurant mode. There you go. I didn't know the right terminology for that. And then the other thing are questions. I know a lot of people are sort of hesitant to ask questions because they think, oh, maybe I, this is a stupid question. But really, there are no stupid questions. So the stuff we're going to be talking about today is a little highbrow. It's a little up there because we're talking about yields and bonds and treasuries and stocks and things like that. So, But if you have a question, that's the best time to stop and, answer, and, and raise your hand. Right, because I guarantee you, if you have a question, chances are someone else is thinking the same thing. So I don't mind questions. Just raise your hand, and then we'll we'll do that. Um, but I have to repeat the questions for our folks at home because we have a lot of people that are going to be listening to this at home. Lord knows why they want to listen to it, but that's that's what's happening. So today's agenda: we're going to talk about what happened in 2008, how stocks performed, what happened there, why they performed like they did, what drove that market performance talk about where we are now, and then we're going to talk about some predictions for 2019. We're already a quarter of the way through that, right? So sounds very simple. Sounds very simple. So let's talk about uh, our geniuses. These are all the different investment bankers, Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, J.P. Morgan, and all those, they're, they're heads of all their economics departments. And they asked them, you know, what do you think, the, what do you think 2008, how do you think that's going to end up? Well, they all averaged about 2,800, and you see we closed at about 2,500. So they were all about 300% or about 300 points off. Now, actually, they were right online up until when? Up until about October, right? And really November when the election happened. It was after the election things really started to slide. So let's talk about what drove that performance or lack of their lack thereof. Partly the trade tensions between us and China, right? Uh, interest rate increases. We've been seeing that coming for some time. And, you know, if you've been reading my letters over the years, you know that's one of the things that we really look at. The midterm elections, like I just said, and then the yield curve inversions. You've been hearing about that more recently because that was a sort of a big deal the other day uh, when the market was down 460 points. Remember that? That was because the two-year... I'll talk about this more, but because of what we call a yield inversion, where a shorter-term bond is paying more interest than a longer-term bond, right? That doesn't intuitively make sense, but we're going to talk about that. Well, here's, the, here's what the market did over that period of time, essentially for 2018, and you can see we hit our all-time high right up there in September, our all-time high. And then we had our election, November 6th. And then you know what happened there. The Democrats took the House back over, and I think there was a lot of uh, confusion about, well, what's going to happen here? Is that going to unwind the tax bill? Bill, you know. Um, but the but the Republicans kept the Senate, and of course they have the the presidency, so that any overturning bill that might come out of the House would just get, uh, even if it made it through the Senate, would just get vetoed. So I think that fear abated. But then uh, we had an interest rate hike. Right on December 3rd, um, December 1st, we had some more trade tensions, and all of that sort of combined together to just drop, drop the market, the bottom out of the market. So we had a lot of people that were fearful, and I had some clients, not they're, they're clients now, but at the time they weren't because we would have told them, don't do that. But, uh, you know, they sold out. They sold out down there at the bottom, and they missed that whole pullback. Now, you guys got a letter from me December 24th or thereabouts. Remember, the time to panic is not yet. Those poor folks didn't get that letter, you know, and they and they sold out. So 
I didn't ha hadn't hadn't planned to send that letter out, but when you have extreme periods of volatility like this, I think people get nervous, and it's a little reassuring, at least it would be for me, to say, hey, look, don't panic now. There's no real reason for it, and in fact, there wasn't. It, it just snapped back, right? Uh, but but at the time, the end of the year, that's the do you know that's the worst pre-Christmas stock market loss we've ever had in our history. No Santa Claus effect on that one. You got that right. But what happened was really from the on the Dow's perspective, from the high to the low, that was a 19% drop, 5, 000, over 5,000 points, 19% drop. And if you've gotten my letter recently, you know that we expect one even bigger than that coming down the pike for too long. So the big one was in, China, in, in uh, last year, was the big talk between China and the United States. A lot of people may not know this, though. Did you know that China used to have a 40% tariff on our cars coming in? Do you know what it is now? Don Don got it down. Well, I thought Don Don got it down to 15. So he went from 40 to 15%. Now, you don't hear that on the news, because that was a, a good thing that he did. Uh, but but that's, that's, the, that's the fact of the matter. But they had a 40% tariff on our cars. Anybody ever been to China? Oh, well, fantastic. What was the number one car over there that you saw? Buick. Buick. Yeah, they love Buicks. Well, you know why now? It's 40% tariff on it. So it was sort of a, sort of a status symbol to, to have the Buicks. But I saw Buicks everywhere. Very strange. So let's talk about that. In March 23rd, that we imposed a 20%, 25% tariff on steel, 10% on aluminum. April 2nd, they put a 2.4 billion worth of our U.S. exports. And the Chinese are pretty smart about this. They're, they're attacking um, Republican or, tr or, or areas of the country where Trump did well in the election. So like the farmers in the Midwest and things like that, they're going after the soybeans and things like that to, to try to affect the, the Trump, Trump supporters. Um, July 1st, Canada adds some tariffs. July 6th, the U.S. opposes tariffs to $34 billion worth of Chinese imports. China matches that. Uh, in August 23rd, Chinese tariffs on $16 billion worth of U.S. exports and U.S. tariffs on $16 billion worth of Chinese imports. So just tit for tat. And the Chinese are very cool customers. I mean, we, we hit them with some tariffs. They, they don't go crazy. They just hit us right back with the same amount. Sort of, you know, you know it's coming. Right? It's like you punch your sister, you're going to get hit back. That's just the way things go at the house, in the household, right? In the play box, in the sandbox. September 24th, the U.S. opposes additional tariffs of 200 billion. China responds with tariffs of 60 billion. So that was pretty cool. They didn't even come back with the, the full weight of what we did. They're playing very cool, I think. Um, and then finally, they decided to sort of, hey, let's just relax here and everybody peace out for a little while. And that's kind of where we are now. So there's some discussions going on behind the scenes. And there's probably going to be a tweet any time where, you know, things are going great. So I think if, if and when, I really do think there will be some sort of deal. And here's why. Because we export basically one-fifth to China what they export to us. They export way, 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 way more stuff to us than we export to them. Their economy needs our economy more than we need their economy. Does everyone sort of agree with that? Can you see what I'm saying? So we could we could just say, okay, hey, 100% tariffs. You know, are you going to put 100% tariff on our stuff? Fine, we're going to put 100% tariff on your stuff. It's going to hurt them way, way more. And you can see this from the emerging markets performance. And the funds that are, we even have a fund in your account, the Oppenheimer Emerging Markets Fund. Emerging markets have not done very well because of this. So I would expect that when this patches up, and it will, when this patches up, because the Chinese know the position they're in. They're not stupid. They see it. They, that's why they did this. That's why they didn't come back with a full $200 billion. They, they know. They can see what's going on here, right? So we are holding the cards on this game, and, you know, we don't – you know, we don't want to have a nuclear option here. We just want to make things fair, right? And I think that's where we're headed. So when that finally works itself out, that's going to be very good news. And I think the emerging markets um, sector will probably just really pop. And I'm expecting something to happen here before the summer. So I'm expecting things to happen pretty good for this summer. And emerging markets will be one of those positions that we sell out of first 
once it once it once it does well. Because you know how these things go. It's all about rumor and the initial reaction. And then once time sort of settles in, then people realize, well, it's not all the fanfare that we thought it was. Right? Kind of like this North the North Korea thing, right? Oh, he's gonna denuclearize. Well, what does that really mean? He's not gonna denuclearize. I mean, they're never gonna denuclearize. So we don't need to pretend like they're going to. All right, so here we are. This is that one key element that we that we follow. Remember, which is interest rates, the Fed funds rate. So you have this federal committee in Washington, and they're made up a bunch of board of governors, and they sit around and they decide: should we raise interest rates or should we lower interest rates? Should we create more money or should we destroy more money? And right now we're but in the destruction phase. Back in 2009, you may remember we had TARP. Toxic Asset Relief Program, and QE2, and QE Infinity. So we went from a base of about $800 billion to $4.4 trillion within just a few years. Okay. Well, that $4.4 trillion is now about $3.7, $3.8 trillion. So they created a whole bunch of money, and then they're slowly destroying it as we go, which is a good thing. We don't want all that money out, out because it creates massive inflation. But... We do know that once they start raising rates, oftentimes, I can't say it's 100%, but oftentimes following that, we will have a stock market correction, right? So now we're going through that same phase of raising rates and the other factor, which is reducing the balance sheet, which is essentially destroying money electronically. Money is created and destroyed electronically these days in our economy. Does everyone kind of know that? By now? Right. So that's one of those things that's happening, and they're looking for something called the soft landing. They think that they can raise the rates to just the right amount that the market won't crash. You know, And, and maybe they're right. And I do appreciate they're trying. I really do. I appreciate the fact that they're pausing. I appreciate the fact that they're waiting to see how that's going to work out, because in years past, they just kept jacking it up and then just carelessly sort of let things fall where they may. But now we know the effects of that. So we'll see how this works. Um, this used to be my number one concern, right? How many of you received the letter from me just recently pre preparing for the market correction part four? Okay. Clients are always going to receive it first. I mean, that's just the way we do it. I mean, clients are going to get it first, and then we get to everybody else when we can. So the rest of you, it's coming. It'll probably be in, it's in the mail. Should be, you should be getting it soon, but the clients have already received it. But it's about a lot about what I'm talking about here today. Um, but if you're those of you who have already read that letter, then you know the secret that I'm about to unfold on the rest of the phone. Okay, so just some more statistics, market history. These little green things here are different recessions going all the way back to 1947. You know, just statistics that can tell you that, you know, once you had a 20% market decline, you know, then you're, then you're in correction territory. It's interesting because remember in December we had basically a 19% market decline, so not quite there. But, um, you know, in 1987 we had the flash crash. In in, uh, back in 19, what is that, 62, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. So those are geopolitical events that really can affect the market quickly. But for the most part, when we have these massive declines, it's because we're going through a monetary contraction phase like we are now. And that's sort of a red flag for us to, to let ourselves know that, hey, we need to be a little more cautious. And I'll show you what, what I really mean by that. The other thing, remember, is this yield curve inversion. And this is probably the hardest thing for people to get their, their head around. But it's almost fun. You can play a game if you want to with the news. Doesn't matter if it's CNN, Fox, CNBC, whatever it is, doesn't matter. What you're looking at is you're looking for stocks and treasuries, right? And I like the Dow Jones and the two-year treasury. Well, we, I use, it's called SHY, S-H-Y. But you just look at these things on, and you, you can put them up on your phone. Whenever the market is having a great day, treasuries will be down. The dollar will be down. And treasury yields will be up. Whenever we're having a bad international day, like we did the other day, when the market dropped 460 points, treasury spiked. The price spiked. The yield dropped. So I don't know if you knew this. I used to be a disc jockey, one of my first jobs, and I would read the news off the AP Press. 
And it was always important to have uh, more exciting press than more mundane press, right? Because people tuned in for more exciting news. And usually, bad news was a whole lot better than good news. So you could say, oh gosh, treasury prices plummeted today. Well, what does that mean? Treasury, treasury prices plummeted. Well, it meant that people weren't so scared. At the same time, the market was up 500 points. So I could have said, you know, treasury yields soared today. Well, yes, if treasury prices plummet, treasury yields soar. But what does it sound better? What sounds better? Treasury prices plummeted. Right? That's a lot more exciting than treasury yield soared. But it's exactly the same thing. Do you see what I'm saying? And we're getting a lot of that spin, folks, on the, in the media. And I just want you to be aware of it, that you can spin it any way you want to. You know what Mark Twain said. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I would like to in, intercede there to say government statistics. But it's not, that's, that's not what Mark Twain said. But now, talk about the yield curve one more time. Think about it from a CD, certificate of deposit. What pays more, a one-year CD or a five-year CD? Typically a five-year. Five and in, in the CD world, yes, it almost it always does. Okay, but in the treasury world, what's paying more, a one-year treasury or a five-year treasury? Well, that's the problem. Okay, but let me just say this: Is the five-year treasury and the ten-year treasury are those? artificially manipulated or are they market driven? Ah, okay. Well, I'll tell you, they're market driven. That's right. So the longer term you go, the less market driven it is. The one person that we asked to put his phone on mute, but you know what? It's okay. It's okay. This is the only guy we're not going to kick out because he is actually a World War II hero from the Battle of Bastogne. He's 90, I don't know how old are you, Jeff? Four, four. 94 years old. And still kicking. And still, and still shooting a 50 caliber, right? <laughs> but this guy was at the Battle of Bastogne, you know, where Patton raced to the, to the north to, 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 uh, to, to save those guys. So what a great honor to have him here. Um, but in any event, so going back to that interest rate inversion, so in the CD world, yes, shorter term uh, CDs pay lower rates than longer term rates. Generally, the two year bond is going to pay a lower rate than the 10 year bond. The problem is, is at the very, very front end of interest rates, the overnight rate, those guys are jacking it up artificially. So in the very short term, it's affected, whereas the longer term bonds are affected mainly by supply and demand, which, is, which are market forces that we like. Artificial changes are market forces that we don't like. And usually market forces will react against artificial changes. This happens again and again and again. Okay, so what this chart shows is the time that it takes from for the S&P, because generally after an inversion, the market does well. Okay, so it's not always bad, but generally after an inversion, the market does well. Um, in fact, from 78, that period of time, it was up 2.2 percent from 1980. It was up 11.9 from in 88 through 90. It was up 33 percent from 98 through 2000. It was up 39 percent. So the average there was about 22 percent. Oh, I can't go backwards. Sorry. Yes, sir. Um, how long is that inversion? What, what's the time period so you choose that as a base? Not a single day. No, it happens. It, it, it could be for weeks or days. Okay. Yeah. But what the other chart was trying to show that in general, after an inversion, we have about 18 months on average before we have a downturn. And between the inversion and the downturn, we have a growth of about 22 percent. Does everybody follow me? So if we're going to follow that logic, then we say, OK, well, today we're in the inversion period. We know we have a period of time before the crash or the correction, let's say, because no one likes to say the word crash. We have to say correction. So um, after a period of time between now and the correction, we're going to have some growth. I think that's fair to say. So no emergency today, but I think 
the inversion is also part of the total analysis to say that, well, we need to start looking for the exits. We need to start looking for the exits. Do you have a question, Joe? Later. No? Okay. Scotch, if that was your single malt, if that was your, if that was your question. Yes, sir. Earl. Earl Ferguson has a question. Key inversion rate is the two-year versus ten. Yes, the key inversion rate that they look at is the ten-year and the two-year. Yeah. Right now, they are not inverted unless it happens today. But the short-term inversion rate is the two-year versus ten. Right. How do you weigh the significance of that versus the traditional two and ten? It's just a it's a different metric. So Earl was asking, okay, the, the, the 10 and the 2 have not inverted, but the 10 and the 1 have inverted. What's the big difference? Well, the big difference is the 1 is much closer to the overnight, and the overnight is being manipulated. Okay, So the farther out you go from overnight rate, the less manipulation can affect it. Okay, That's the short answer. All right, so let's talk about where we are now. Yes, sir. Because rate rises have historically caused recessions, and inversions occur in rising rate environments. Because here's why. Let's just talk about the CD scenario again, okay? You're going to the bank today. Well, I just gave you guys all $100,000, and I send you to the bank, and I'm going to say, go buy a CD. What are you going to do? What kind of CD are you going to buy? Champs? Well, you only get to buy one. What are you going to buy? What term? Short term. Why? Ted, what are you going to buy? Why? But you think rates are going up, right? Isn't that where we're headed? Yeah. So if you think rates are going to go up, why are you going to lock in on a five-year CD? You're not. So if you think rates are going to go up, why do you want to buy a 10-year bond? You don't because it's going to lose value in all things being equal. So that's why the shorter term is actually doing better than the longer term, because there's no demand for the longer term right now, all things being equal. Did that answer your question? Uh, kind of. It's, well, it's a side effect of what's going on. It's the side effect of monetary reduction, okay, which is, has everything to do with rising rates. So it only happens when we have rising rates. And it just so happens that that's what causes market crashes, market uh, capital reduction, monetary contraction, and the money supply. Okay? I've got some great books for you that, were really, uh, that will really shed some light on that. That's right. That's exactly right. The inversion is just a just a side benefit of the right of the rising rates. That's exactly right. It's a symptom of the disease. It's not the disease itself. Yes, thank you. Very good. Okay, so here's kind of where we've been. Right, we peaked out in uh, October, September there at the end. Then we had all of our problems. Had a big drop, a 19% drop, and since then. It's been a pretty good ride. Been a pretty good ride. Uh, you see where we crossed over there. So, you know, like I said in my letter right around Christmas time, there was nothing fundamental that would have caused that drop. It was all just rumors and fear. But there are some fundamentals that do worry me. Um, this is January 2018. These are all the different sort of factors that we look at. Uh, monetary policy, U.S. economic outlook, yield curve, consumer sentiment, disposable personal income. Now, this was the beginning of last year, January, so a little over a year ago. Everything looks really good. The only thing that looks red is what? Geopolitical risk. I can tell you folks, geopolitical risk is always red. As long as we have problems in the Middle East, it is always going to be red. And I don't ever see it turning green. Um, but in any event, it's still red, <laughs> and we just kind of try to have to ignore that one. But political environment, yellow, equity market valuation, because at the beginning of January, 
uh, stocks were getting pretty high. And so the valuations were getting a little rich, right? Um, and I'll show you more about that. And in December, right, things had sort of turned south a little bit, and a lot more yellow is showing up on our screen here. So uh, the housings, uh, fewer housings, fewer new buildings going up, uh, monetary policy not quite as amenable as it used to be, still some ge geopolitical risk, political environment still sour, um, global economic outlook. That was probably the number one thing that sort of um, turned everybody a little sour in terms of, you know, expecting more growth because Europe has slowed down a good bit. Anybody ever heard of eurosclerosis? Yeah. The Europeans, God bless them, just don't get it uh, sometimes. Uh, and I think the European, you know, you see the, what's going on with Brexit right now. And I feel really sorry uh, for Theresa May because, you know, she runs over to Belgium, gets her face beaten in, and she comes back over to the House of Parliament, and they beat her up, and, you know, she was hoarse for there for a couple of weeks, and the poor lady just can't take, get a break, you know? And now they're talking about getting rid of her altogether, and I think she's probably ready. She said, Hell, I'm out of here. You guys handle it, you know? Sick of this. Uh, so, but I like her. Um, but it's a real problem because Brexit, uh, the European Union, doesn't want to make it too sweet of a deal for Great Britain or else – there's going to be other countries lining up to to Brexit, you know, and that's their real that's their they're really scared about. So we can talk more. Uh, but now here's what we are kind of try to avoid, and this is what we're all kind of looking at, you know, again, which is what happened in December 2008. Everything has turned red for the most part, except market valuation because stocks had crashed so much. The companies are still earning, they're still profitable, but their stock prices have dropped so much that now that it looks like a good buy, right? So, you know, the interesting thing is, what do you think this, this looked like in, in January of 2008? It was all green. Yeah, January of 2008, everything was green. So it can change on a dime, it can change quickly. You everybody see how fast it dropped in December? You know, it can drop two, three, four, five hundred 500 points in a day. We've seen it. And then it takes several days for it to recover. Because panic ha happens a lot time, a lot faster. You know, fear happens a lot faster than greed. Except for a couple of you. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Ted. Okay, so any questions? That? Good. Leading economic indicators, still good. Yes, Shamps? of your automated uh, buying, selling, you know, on large scale with the algorithms that they have developed were not as refined then than they are today. So is there, <clears throat> are these algorithms uh, like a factor in what the market does now as opposed to what it did in 2008? So Shams is asking about the computer. A lot of these stock traders, the big houses, are trading using computers, and these computers are using algorithms, and a lot of those algorithms have improved over the last 10 years, uh, but a lot of those algorithm champs still go off market volatility and the VIX, the volatility index, and so generally what will happen is after 2 o'clock, if there's a lot of volatility, those, those algorithms will go into effect. So I don't see a lot of difference. I will say that once we have a downward spiral, that those algorithms will probably exacerbate the problem. So I don't see those algorithms as helpful for us as a society, as an economy. You know, they're just, because they're trying to do, you know, super fast trading, because uh, they have, you know, mainframes that can get in and sell and get out before the rest of us can even get a price ticker. Uh, so, so it's a problem, I think. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's gonna help us. when you were a DJ and what, uh, what garners the, uh, the response, the audience, etc. I guess a big question that I have is who can I believe today? That's a great question. You know, um, what Bob is saying is, you know, when I, when I was doing my DJ work, uh, fear is 3.2 percent or 3.2 times more exciting than good news. 
So bad, you're more likely, you're 3.2 times more likely to tune in again to follow up on bad news than you are any good news. So the media industry knows this, and that's why we oftentimes mostly have bad news, because that is, it's like a train wreck. You just can't help but look, all right? It's just human nature. I'm not going to place any blame, Bill. It's just human nature, right? That's right. Uh, so uh, looking at the leading indicators, you can see that we're at an all-time high in terms of leading indicators. Now, what is a leading indicator? Well, uh, new house permits, new building permits, uh, orders for manufacturers, new orders. You know, Toyota all just ordered a whole bunch of... Uh, uh, rubber from Rubbermaid. <laughs> I don't know, just making that up. <laughs> but uh, but those are leading indicators, and they're all very they're all very high right now. But one thing that I've learned about all these indicators is they, they can change on a dime, and a lot of the indicators only indicate things after the market has tanked. You know, so you have to really kind of read through read through the lines to get to the get to the bottom of things. And I'm going to show you that. But right now, because of the recent sell-off in the market, valuations for stocks look pretty good. So I would not hesitate to see maybe a 20% rally from here, just based on what we've seen in the historically. Once we had an inversion, on average, we'll have a 20% rally that averages about 18 months. We're kind of set up for that now because we're seeing a P.E. of roughly 14. Now, what's P.E., price-earnings ratio? What is that? Ted? Earnings uh, over the price of the stock. Well, PE, essentially price earnings, means it takes 14 years for the earnings of that company to pay for itself. So if you have a PE of 10, that means it takes 10 years for the earnings to pay for the price. Well, do you know what the PE ratios were back in the late 1990s, 1999? It was like 100 or more. It would take 100 years for a stock to pay for itself. Is that a good deal? No. But were people buying it? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. How much were people paying for tulips in 1129 in Amsterdam? A lot. How much were they paying for them in 1500? Nothing. Right. So I could be wrong about my years. But here we are again, you know, we've got the PE down here closer, closer to 50, and that's a pretty good buy for, 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 for everything if you're looking at it just from that perspective. But there are things to look at. Talk about the forecast again for 2019. Same guys talking about the S&P 500. They're averaging about 2,900. Now, we know they were about, what, 600 points off last time, but that was the De December effect, which I sort of – chalk up to somewhat of an anomaly, but let's say if they're, they're talking about close to 3,000, and here we are, there's 19 or 2019, you know, we're close right here to about 2850. So if they're saying 3,000, that's not far away from our all-time high, you know. And I can just tell you for the clients that we're looking at, we're looking at the positions, and we're looking for our all-time highs, and we're going to start migrating out. Why? I'll show you in just a second. Not necessarily because of interest rates. That's one thing. That's the first thing, and probably the, the underlying premise. See what, I'll show you what's going on here in a second. Inflation. How is inflation forecast? Pretty low. Pretty low. But remember, they changed the formula for inflation. They changed it in 1980, and they changed it again in 1990. So if you went back and you looked at the way they figured inflation pre-1980, using the same... Bureau of Labor Statistics formula that they had back then is closer to 8 9%. You know? So again, going back to Mark Twain, there's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics. And then I add on that government statistics. Because guess what? If I have massive inflation, I'm the U.S. government, and I have a lot of inflation and the CPI goes up a lot, what do I have to do? Change the CPI method. Well, yeah, but exactly. That, that's my answer, Champ. That's what they did. Okay, so I don't want a lot of inflation. Why? Because I've got to increase your Social Security checks. Does everybody remember that? You get your, your Social Security uh, living increase, cost of living increase. If I'm the U.S. government, I don't want to do that. 
I don't want to increase your social security checks. So I'm going to change the formula so that the formula says that we don't have this much inflation. And folks, I'm not, I'm not lying to you. Do the research. That's what they did. They changed it in 80 and they changed it again in 90. So if we went back to the way they used to calculate it, we were closer to 8, 9%. Unemployment is a lot higher than the way they figure it these days, you know, because there's those people that are hopelessly unemployed and those people that are just, you know, not going to work. Interesting thing here about the, the, uh, um, the correlation between equities, stocks, and interest rates, and especially treasuries. There's never been a time, and again, you have to take that for what it's worth, there's never been a time at least where treasury yields were below 5% that we had a crash. Okay, So treasury yields, the 10-year treasury has always been above 5% whenever we've had a crash. So that's sort of a one thing that we can look, but let me just, the caveat to that is the interest rate ride that we just went through from 2009 through today is lowest that it's ever been. You know, back in 2010, 12, 11, we were, we were, we were less than one-tenth of one percent. One-tenth of one percent. Never, ever, ever been that low. So to say that, well, the market's never crashed when interest rates have been that low or had that high, you know, is, I think is a little of a misnomer. It's not necessarily true. I, so I wouldn't put a lot of credence in that. But it's interesting to note that, okay, as long as the 10-year treasury is under 5%, not, maybe not extremely imminent, let's say. Um, forecast for growth domestic product. Been pretty good. Um, 2019, these are still estimates, but the estimates look pretty good. 2018 was, was a good year. 2019 looks about the same, maybe not quite as good. We can definitely see things slowing down. Do you get that feeling? Maybe not. If you're in traffic, you probably don't. If you go to, if you go to Perimeter Mall, I'm sure you do not. We had seasons of 52 yesterday. We, had, we took our 90 year old, uh, one of our 90 year old clients out for his 90th birthday in seasons 52, and the place was just packed. You know? I even mentioned on the way back, man, I'm ready for a crash, because then we'll be able to get in without a reservation. Remember how nice it was in 2009? You could go to any restaurant. You didn't have to wait for any, anybody. Everybody was at home eating sandwiches. Huh? Even the traffic was Yeah, the traffic was better. Yeah, that's right. I'm just kidding. I don't want that. But it, it, you'll see that it'll happen. Pay attention. Unemployment, again, you know, unemployment's at an all-time low. Unemployment being at an all-time low is a very inflationary indicator. But again, they've changed the formulas. So if you go back and you use the other formulas, we're actually closer to 20% unemployment. You know? So I just don't put a lot of credit into these numbers that I get. Let's talk about some tailwinds. So in the future, this is kind of what we see. Credit is still available. I mean, I know people who are getting loans for houses in the $600,000 range, and they, there's no way they could afford that, unless 100% of their income goes to that. Remember that? We had that back in 2006 and 2007. I mean, you could, uh, um, a piece of toast could get a mortgage. Um, I, saw, I saw stuff back in, uh, back in those days where you, there were no doc loans. You know? um, this is before 2008. Remember when we had the 1% arms, LIBOR? So you had a 3-1 one, one arm on LIBOR at 1%. Then what happened after the three years? The arm was up, right? Man, did that adjust up. People didn't realize how much their payments would increase by just a modest rate in the interest rate. It was amazing. I know people that lost their homes because of that. I'm related to at least one. <laughs> uh, consumer spending. Now, did you know, and I've, I've said this many times, but 70% of our economy is built around us and what we consume. And we're really good at it. I mean, we've really got this down. And in fact, I think a lot of people go and, and shopping just as a, what is it? It's almost a psychological feel good. I'm going to go shopping because it makes me feel better. Don, you know something about that? Irene, did you want to? No, okay. Corporate profits. Corporations are still profitable because we're still spending money. Well, that's very good. Equity market prices have, I, have dropped, as I said. They're not astronomical like they were in the late 90s. You know, they're reasonable. 14, 
14 PE is very, very reasonable, and that is actually an attractive buy. Anything over 20 of a PE, we start thinking, yeah, that got, gets a little expensive. But under 20 is still very reasonable. Fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is basically the president's budget, you know, what the president's going to spend money on. And I can tell you that I have a lot of clients from Lockheed Martin, and we spend a lot of money on Lockheed Martin, you know, and they have very rich 401k plans, very rich plans. Uh, so that's part of fiscal policy is, you know, spending money. I would like to see more money spent on education because I think our kids are really problematic to say the least. Um, did you know I have a client, they go to Chick-fil-A every Friday. They have a little club, they meet there Friday for breakfast. And just for fun, this is what they do just for fun, they're in their 80s. So just for fun, they'll go up there and they'll pay with cash. You know, so he says his, his, his biscuit and juice is like four seventy three. So he'll put $4 down and 73 cents and change. Okay, two quarters and whatever. But these kids can't count the change. So they'll ask him, you know, is that right? And he'll say, well, count it. They can't count it. They can't count the change, folks. I'm serious. Try it. Try it. Yes. You might have to go to Wendy's or Burger King, but just try it. Keep trying. You'll, you'll run into it. But, you know, I don't know if that's the common core math. I don't know if that's the federal government being in control of the education system. I suspect it's a lot of those things. But it's it's because think about it from your perspective. I'm a 47 going on 48 in like what 40 years I'll probably be laid up in a nursing home or something or maybe uh, the hospital and I've got these little punks coming around to inject me with something and they can't tell the difference between this the, the thalamide and you know whatever else you know or I go through the drive through and I order diet coke because I'm diabetic and I get you know regular coke and then 10 minutes later I'm dead and this is this is a real problem for our society you know we need educated people Right, and especially when the rest of us are in need of medical care, which it's it's coming if you live long enough. It's like I tell, if it's like I tell Jeff. I mean, you know, you don't get out of life without some pain. I mean, if you live long enough, life will kill you. You know, it's a tough it's a tough thing. <laughs> it's true, I've seen it. Um, the labor market, labor market still looks good. You know, uh, except if you're running a restaurant. I talk to people who own restaurants or businesses. They have a hard time staffing it. Did anybody ever go to Mimi's Cafe over here? I used to love Mimi's Cafe. Yeah, and it was great for a while. And then I don't know if you had the experience, but the service just got worse and worse and worse until finally we just stopped going. And then Mimi's Cafe is now where? I mean, it's it's gone. You know, it's gone. And, I, and it used to be just a great little French restaurant. You know, we'd go there for brunch, and it was and it was it was it was packed. But then the service was so bad that eventually just no one ever went. And that's, that's, I saw it happen over two or three years. So what are the problems we're looking at, the headwinds that we have in front of us? Well, you, you can't turn on the TV. I watch, I, watch, uh, I watch BBC because I just can't stand the rest of it. Um, so, you know, they're constantly talking about Brexit. Um, and I feel bad for Theresa May. Like I say, she's going back from Brussels to London, and the poor thing is just not getting anywhere. You know, it's just... They cut her a little slack for it. I mean, I feel terrible for her. The geopolitical risks, you know, Syria thing is winding up. Uh, the North Korea thing looks pretty good. Uh, obviously, we've got some problems now with Hamas and Israel again. That's sort of, you know, blowing up again. I mean, what's going to go on with Gaza? A lot of people are sort of jumping on board that train. But, but again, that's, I mean, I was, I grew up when I came out. Who was 71? Who was president in 71? Nixon still? Carter came along when, 74, 76, okay, so I remember Carter, I don't remember Nixon, I remember Carter, and of course Reagan, Reagan, right, um, but there were, seemed like there was always some problem, always a problem going, so, going on somewhere, so believe it or not, you know, I think in the Western Hemisphere, I think officially we're, we're all at peace, you know, FARC down in Colombia has made peace, and I think that was the, sort of the last hot spot, unless you consider Venezuela. But I think for, you know, Canada all the way down to Alaska, the United States, all the way down to South America, we're, the entire, the entire Western Hemisphere is at peace. It's pretty good, right? We can make the rest of the hemisphere do it. Um, monetary policy, this is the headwind, remember, because they're raising rates. So I'm, I'm very pleased that they've decided to pause. That's a very good thing. 
wage increases. Um, I think that's a good thing, but that's considered inflationary. Corporate debt grant downgrade. This is the one thing that I am now switching my concern to. My original concern was monetary contraction, but now my main concern is corporate debt downgrade. How many of you saw that coming? Well, if you read my letters, you know. Uh, any of the rest of you will get this. But here's a chart that I want to show you. Essentially, what's been going on over the last few years, because interest rates have been so low, and you have, to add, you have to expect there's the rule of unintended consequences. You know, it is a real rule. It is a law. When you do something, there is always going to be an unintended consequence. And the bigger thing that you do, the bigger the unintended consequence that you might expect. So when we dropped rates down to zero, practically zero, for seven, six, seven years, unprecedented, right? there were unintended consequences. One of those unintended consequences, which I think you could have foreseen, was that corporate executives would have floated bond issues. And they have raised money through these bond issues because they've been able to borrow money at very, very low rates. They've taken the money that they've borrowed at these very, very low rates, and they've gone back and they've bought their own stock. You follow me? Now, why would they do that? Huh? Because they've got options. Well, that's the end result, yes. They, buy, they bought back their own stock because less stock out in the market is fewer stock to divide up the profits by. Thus, we have more earnings per share. Right? We were just talking about that. Earnings per share is one of the key things that investors look to when they want to buy shares of stock. When investors see a low earnings per share, what do they want to do? They buy it. When they buy it, what happens? Price goes up. Price goes up. What do, this, what do the executives get? Options, stock options. That's right. And they make out like bandits, and they get bonuses and all these other things. But the end result is that the company now has debt. It has debt. Okay, well, is that so bad? Well, maybe, maybe not. The problem is that these are going to be this is debt that's maturing. Okay, so you just borrowed $500 million. You bought back the stock, good for you. But now you have a balloon payment coming of $500 million that's coming up next year. Do you have the cash? No, we do not. What do we have to do? Refinance. Refinance. Are we going to be as good to get a, get a good a deal? Why not? Rates have gone up. So now we're going to have to pay two or 300% what we did before. Okay, let's just say we can. Let's just say we can. Is it not going to stretch our financials? Yes, it will. Now, here's some more facts for you. We discovered that about 38% of the companies on the S&P 500, so you have the S&P 500, those 500 companies, 38% of them have done this, have bought back their stock, and the problem is that 38% of those companies, S&P 500 companies, folks, big companies, they have a credit rating of triple B. Triple B. Now, what is that? What does that mean? That means it's investment grade. Yes. Yes. Riley hit it. Here is, here is why this is so important. Because these guys have borrowed a lot of money at very, very low rates. Their rating is only triple B. Triple B is one notch above junk. Okay? If I go from triple B to double B, Irene, I just lost my investment grade. I'm now junk. Okay? Well, that in itself is bad, right? But here's the real problem, folks. Now, listen carefully. Here's the real problem. There are mandates out there that say that you have to hold investment grade bonds. What kind of mandates? Well, what about college endowments? What about pension plans? What about investment grade bond funds? All of these things have a mandate, and the mandate says you must own X amount of investment grade bonds. And as soon as these bonds that I have in my portfolio now are no longer investment grade, what do I have to do? How long do I have? Not long, 30 days, you're out of, they're out of there. 
So I sell them, you sell them, Harvard sells them, Yale sells them, Oglethorpe sells them, you know, PIMCO sells them, Oppenheimer sells them, the state of Iowa sells them, the state of New Jersey sells them. What do we have? A buying opportunity. You have a buying opportunity for the long term. For the long term, maybe, right? But in the short term, you have a flood of bonds on the market, and then the price just collapses. It's a downward spiral, right? There you have it. There you have it. So I didn't make that up. That's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm worried about. So as interest rates continue to rise, even if they don't rise anymore, you're going to have these maturities. And as these maturities occur, you're going to have some downgrades. As you have downgrades, I'm afraid it's going to be a spiral effect. Yes? Are we going to see them migrating out? Are they going to be a good indicator? <laughs> they leave for personal reasons because they see it coming. Oh, they insider out. selling is at an all-time high, yes. That's the other indicator that we – insider selling yeah. is happening, yes. <laughs> the stock. Yeah, because they're not in the bond – they don't care about the bonds. They're in it for the stock options. Any questions about that? Do you see the problem? Right? You see how it's, a, it's, it's an unintended consequence? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, think about yourself. You've got a balloon loan coming. You don't have the cash to pay it. Maybe some do, maybe some don't. But even if they do, it's still going to crunch their financials. And Moody's and, and Standard and Poor's are already arguing about downgrading. It's the conversation has been going on for six months now about downgrades. Who's going to downgrade first, right? And, it, and, it, and whether they can afford it or not is not the issue. The issue is they're going to be downgraded just by one notch. Not a big deal, one notch. But that notch, because they're just heads above water, that one notch could sink, could sink them. Now, I'm not saying those, those companies are going to file bankruptcy. I'm just saying that the price of their bonds may tumble, and it may very well be a very good buying opportunity. Okay, but for that to happen, then, the whole, then everything else is going to have to reverse. Interest rates are going to have to drop again. The Fed's going to have to do more. Stimulus, you know, stimulus, quantitative easing, buying bonds, expanding the, the money supply. Those are all words for the same thing, which means printing money. They just don't want to use that word, printing money. Why? Well, because we understand what it means and we don't like it. It doesn't end well. But quantitative easing, hey, sounds good. Buying treasuries, sounds good. But they don't ask them, well, where did you get the money to buy those treasuries? Well, well, we we just made that up. Yes. So the, the, the company owns stock. There's a treasury stock to the company that owns it. Would they possibly sell any of it? Kind of leak it out? Obviously, they can't. Leak well, it. by the time they want to sell, it, yeah, it's a problem. Is by the time they decide to sell it, market's already market's already caught on. And I'm not the only person that knows this. I mean, I, this is stuff I'm getting from other people, and this is going on behind the scenes, right? And the, the institutional guys will get out first. We saw that in December already. Anybody else? Okay. So the question is, what do we do, right? Is that what you're thinking? What are we going to do? And I know that most of you already know the answer. The answer is treasuries. Take a look at this. The three on the top here are stocks, the S&P, the Dow Jones, and the NASDAQ. The three on the bottom are treasuries, the one to three year, the three to seven, and the 10 year plus. Or seven to ten, but you can see in 2007 everything was doing great. The end of 2007 was getting a little shaky. That's why Treasuries were doing well. Did you see how your Treasuries did in December? I don't know if you really pay attention to Treasuries. It's not that exciting, but go back and look at them. You guys had a rally in the Treasuries in December. In 2008, look how everything was down in the marketplace. International was down even more. And emerging markets were down over 50 percent. But look how the Treasuries did. Now, normally these treasuries are only going to eke out about 1% or 2%. But during times of extreme volatility, there's a lot of demand for them, and that, and that rise, raises the price a lot. So here we have the um, one- to three-year treasury was up a little under 5%. The three- to seven-year treasury was up 12 Now, you can see the 10-year treasury and, and beyond that was up a lot, but in 2009, you can see it gave a good bit of it back. So we think the sweet spot is right in here, right in here, the three to seven. Because, because it did well, it held up, we made some money there, and we didn't lose it the following year. Make sense? 
Any questions? When the market drops, this will do well. When interest rates get high enough to cause a uh, credit crunch. You know, that's it. I don't, I don't know. But we can see it kind of happening, you know. So we've gotten rid of all of our junk bonds or high yields. We didn't have that much to begin with. We're mining all of our municipals over to treasuries. By the end of this, by the end of September, I want to have 70% of our money out of the market into treasury, 70%. Because even though interest rates may not go higher, I'm telling you, when, these, when those bonds start m ballooning and when they start having to refinance it, they're going to get downgraded. I see it coming. I can just see it coming. Just like we saw those mortgages coming in 2006. We can see the resets coming. And sure enough, it, it crashed us. Yes, excuse me. It, uh, Is there an indicator for uh, corporate status of corporate bonds in general? <laughs> Uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. And see, the, the, the bond aggregate includes corporates, uh, and there's treasuries in there. It has all mixed in there together. So you can't, there's no one index that you can look. There, there are corporate bond indices, but you have to go and dig inside each single company and look at their balance sheets, you know, each, each, each single company. Because the, a lot of these funds, like the, you know, the PIMCO Institutional um, Investment Grade Bond Fund, or the Vanguard Institutional Van Investment Grade Barn Fund, by prospectus, they can only hold investment grade bonds. And whether they think they're investment grade or not, it doesn't has nothing to do with it. It's all about how they're rated by Standard & Poor's or Moody's, right? The biggest corporate bond holder right now is BlackRock. Yes. Yes, Tread. Tread carefully, my friend. <laughs> okay, so now, but what, to put it all in perspective, though, just to put it in perspective, this is a kind of a, a busy chart. But at the top of the chart, you're showing, okay, from every year to year to year, one year to the next, we had the high, which is the green, and we had the low, which is the red. You know, so what this is showing is, you know, in for a year in 1980, for instance, the stock market ended up 26%. But during that period of time, it was as low as 17, right? If we go back to 1995, the market ended up 34%, but at some point during the year, it was down three. You see that? But now look at all of them. Almost every single year had some point that it was way down, that it was red. And the problem with most investors is there are people. People are emotional. When you get emotional, you're tied to your money and you react emotionally. And so when people see money losses, oh my gosh, I lost $400,000. How can you not be emotional, right? And then you make, you make, a, you make a change, you know? It's just, a, it's just a thing, it happens. So you know, knowing that, going into that with that mindset is helpful. Because if we have half your money in stock, as long as you're quality, even if we miss it, even if we miss it, we've got enough in treasuries to cover your expenses, right? And then we'll make it through and let those recover. How am I doing on time? Five after. Okay, five after. So Riley's hungry. That means i got to... All right. Last two slides, then we're done, right? Yes, sir. Because of exactly the same thing as I'm saying. Shams is asking, he says that Vanguard is, is saying that they're, they're downgrading their expectations of their returns on all their funds this year, and they're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. They're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. Um, you just can't, you can't go on like that. You know, interest rates are rising. Those balloons are happening. The credit downgrades are going to occur. The the, the markets, their institutions are going to drop the drop the the bonds. The bonds are going to drop in price, and then the stocks are going to follow. I think. You got a question? No. Okay. Yes, sir. One question. Yeah. All. Yeah, I don't expect to be. We're not going to be an international at all. They 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 have they're going to have a real problem. Yeah, emerging markets, you're out. International, you're out. Small cap, you're out. You're gone. 
Silver, we're going to hold our silver because when, when once the market has a correction, uh, then they're going to have more TARP and they're going to have more QE and they're going to drop rates back down. And when that happens, precious metals scream, right? We've got a new mess with this back there. He knows. Tell him. <laughs> All right. How much do I owe you for that? <laughs> okay, so here, just to wrap it up, but then we're going to get to lunch. Um, steps for you to take. Keep us in the loop with things that are changing in your family. Uh, concerns that you have about your investments. December was a sort of a good litmus test. That was a good litmus test. I didn't have any calls. Very proud of you all. Um, but that was sort of a good litmus test because we know these things are coming. And we want to make sure that everybody's legal documents are up to date. So everybody's going through the tax problems right now we have. But once tax time is over, let's just make sure our legal documents are in place. And I think all of our clients have that um, together. Steps for us to take, obviously, is to keep the communication up. I think the communication is key to let you know what's going on. Um, managing those investments. Corey, everybody in here has taken the little test. We all have our allocation that we're in. We're following that allocation. But even if your allocation is 60-40, meaning 60% 60 in stocks, 40% out, by the end of the year, it'll be half of that. So we're going to have to talk. And I know some people are going to have tax issues, and I'll be talking to you individually. But um, it's like, I, you know, it's like this. We're either going to lose those gains or we're going to have to pay taxes on them. It's your choice. I'll do whatever you want. But we think paying taxes on them is the, is the wiser thing to do these days. And then finally, you know, just staying on top of the market and, and, and following, you know, now, you know, now that the Fed is going to slow down a little bit on the um, interest rate hikes, our job now is going to get behind the scenes and dig into those corporate bonds. I'm going to try to figure out who's going to, who's going to get downgraded first. And, and I'll let you know. Any questions? That wasn't so bad, huh? Not so bad? You feel like you learned something? Yeah. All right, cool. Yes, champs. <coughs> Look at all the implications of the new tax laws and how do they impact people in our age group and see what are some of the smart things we can do to you know, reduce our tax bite. Yeah, we usually do our tax seminar right after. What did we do? Well, we couldn't do one this year already, but we'll do one right after tax time after Henry comes up from air. We'll rest, resuscitate him and stick him up here. Or uh, AGI goes up, you get hit with the IRMA. <laughs> yeah, IRMA. Yep. Yeah. I can tell you that most of the tax changes occurred at the corporate area. And what, from what I've seen from individuals that are actual taxpayers, it hasn't, been that, it hasn't really been that beneficial because the deductions have, have gone down. You know, So it's kind of hit and miss for some people. Listen, I want to thank everybody for coming. I, I appreciate your patience for the delay. Thank you.